Welcome to the History Junk Shop, where overlooked facts turn out to be treasures. I'm Eugene Finnerman, a writer, a lecturer, nine-game winner on Jeopardy, that's my epitaph, and I'm a troubadour of history. History is fascinating because it's everything. Surprise, it's our who, what, where, and why. We are the sum of the achievements, disasters, and follies of history. And sometimes history haunts us. Since it's late October, let's start with a real Halloween story. The Salem Witch Trials. Halloween was not always adorable. In 1692, the children of Salem, Massachusetts went door to door accusing everyone of witchcraft. Trick or treat! Our Pilgrim Fathers may have observed Thanksgiving once a year, but they suspected every day was Halloween. This world was the devil's dominion, and Satan was after them. Somehow their morbid, fearful nature is never depicted in Hallmark commercials. Americans speak of the Pilgrim Fathers, independent-minded, hard-working, and pious people who helped settle this land. We like to believe that we are imbued with their virtues, but they left us with another legacy as well, and its shame weighs upon our history and national conscience. Our Puritan heritage must include the Salem Witch Trial. In 1692, the province of Massachusetts Bay, as the state was then known, had a population of 56,000 English colonists. Strict puritanical Protestants, they had come to the New World to build a society that reflected their values. The Puritans believed in hard work and regarded a good crop or a profitable year as a mark of God's approval. They also encouraged literacy, particularly for reading the Bible and almanacs. But their creed also imbued them with a morbid fear of the world. It was the devil's dominion, and Satan was after them. They did not accept the idea of luck or accident, the poor crop, the dead calf, or the fall from a ladder was likely the work of the fiend. And just as God had his beloved congregation, so did Satan. Witches. These dominion, excuse me, these minions of hell, having sold their soul to know the black arts, used magic to afflict the godly. These were not merely the superstitious babblings of the ignorant, but the firm convictions of the educated as well. The Reverend Cotton Mather, a Harvard graduate and one of New England's most promising young leaders, had made a study of demonic possession of the mentally ill. His memorable provinces relating to witchcraft and possessions was regarded as a medical textbook. Indeed, the book would soon be used as evidence in Salem, Massachusetts. In early 1692, nine-year-old Elizabeth Paris, the daughter of the town's minister, and her 11-year-old cousin, Abigail Williams, began running about in a violent frenzy and speaking gibberish. Modern medicine has offered several theories as to the cause of such behavior. Food poisoning, attention deficit disorder, or children being children. However, 17th century medicine had a more occult diagnosis. The local magistrates were alerted and with the coercing help of the Reverend Samuel Parrish, the two children were coaxed into naming three witches who had cursed them. 
Tutuba was the slave of the Paris family. Sarah Good was a beggar, and Sarah Osborne had quarreled with the Reverend. The three women were arrested. When accused of witchcraft, Good and Osborne maintained their innocence, but Tutuba confessed. The slave from Barbados was already incriminated by her exotic background. The folklore of the Caribbean, you know, the tales she told the children, now were cited as evidence against her. Hoping to save herself, Tutuba testified, the devil came to me and bid me serve him, accusing Good and Osborne of forcing her to sign the devil's book. Presumably, the Paris family now had been exorcised, but then other young women proclaimed their bedevilment. Anne Putnam was the daughter of one of Salem's most prominent and ambitious families. The teenager and her immediate circle of friends all claimed to be tortured by witches. Historians have noted that Anne and her clique accused people who had feuds with the Putnams. A man was dragged from Maine to face the charge of witchcraft. By coincidence, he also had an unpaid debt to Anne's family. Land disputes with the Putnams also were settled by a charge of witchcraft. Other young women in neighboring towns now came forth with accusations of witchcraft. In Ipswich, servant Mary Warren accused her bad-tempered employers of witchcraft. They were arrested. More and more people were accused. Within two months, 400 people had been investigated, and 200 were jailed. Most protested their innocence, some 40 confessed, however, expecting clemency for their cooperation. Of course, that cooperation required to incriminate others, naming names. When Abigail Hobbs was arrested, she accused her mother, Deliverance. After her arrest, Deliverance Hobbs accused her husband, William. Breaking with the family tradition, William maintained his innocence and accused no one else. The jails were overcrowded and getting worse, but there were no trials. The local magistrates did not have the authority. A special court was required to try witches, one established by the royal governor, and Massachusetts was awaiting his arrival from London. On May 14, 1692, Sir William Phipps landed in Boston and in the middle of a crisis. He was born in New England and certainly was used to the Puritan personality, but he did not expect to judge 200 cases of witchcraft. Phipps was not even a lawyer, but a shipbuilder who had grown rich in the salvage business. But acting quickly, Phipps established this special court on May 27th. William Stoughton, an ordained minister, was named the Chief Justice. The trials began in early June, barely two weeks. Only Puritan males were eligible to be jurors. Since Salem had a population of 600, the accused and the jurors would have known each other. In trying a witch, there were a number of precedents and tests. Of course, a spinster was always suspicious. Any physical blemish could be considered a mark of Satan. A mole or a wart was incriminating. A birthmark was practically a death warrant. Any mishap that occurred to a neighbor might be weighed against the accused. 
Remember when my wheelbarrow broke? You did that. However, the accused could prove their innocence by reciting without a mistake the Lord's Prayer. Justice Stoughton, however, would consider an additional form of ed evidence, dreams and visions. When Elizabeth Paris claimed that she saw Sarah Good flying on a broom, this court accepted that as proof. The trials themselves became a stage for hysterics. English justice required that the accuser face the accused, and the nine afflicted girls sat in the court. In the presence of the accused, the bewitched would react with fits, shrieks, and accounts of spectral attacks. In court, Anne Putnam would claim that she was being strangled by the evil powers of the accused, the 71-year-old Rebecca Nurse. Of course, the attack was invisible, but the court accepted it as evidence. However, the jury initially did not, an acquitted nurse. Judge Stoughton did not accept that verdict and told the jurors to find her guilty. The intimidated panel complied. English law, the Puritan disposition, and the Old Testament concurred, thou shall not suffer a witch to live. Rebecca Nurse, who was certainly guilty of a land dispute with the Putnams, was hanged. She would be one of 19 to die on the gallows. An 80-year-old man, Giles Corey, was crushed to death by stones. He had refused to say whether he was guilty or innocent when brought before the court. So he was encouraged to make a plea. Well, he died refusing to. Four of the accused simply died in prison. You can imagine the sanitary conditions. A four-year-old child imprisoned for witchcraft went mad. But the real crime was the trials themselves, the absurd evidence, the courtroom hysterics, and Judge Stoughton's obvious bias. This court tried 26 cases, and all the accused were found guilty. The public, at least those stay safe from Stoughton's immediate jurisdiction, protested the scandal. Increase Mather, president of Harvard and father of Cotton Mather, wrote in a public letter, it were better that 10 suspected witches should escape than one innocent person be condemned. Governor Phipps agreed. In October 1692, he dissolved the special court, halted the executions, and forbid further arrests. Those imprisoned without formal charge were released. That was hundreds of people. The remaining 56 cases of witchcraft were transferred to the Superior Court in Boston. In those proceedings, without the spectral evidence and courtroom hysterics, 53 of the accused were found innocent. Of the three found guilty, even they were released from prison by May 1693. However, there was no punishment for the genuinely guilty, other than what their conscience dictated. On January 14, 1697, the legislature of Massachusetts ordered a day of fasting and repentance for the Salem hysteria, five years later. The proclamation was written by Samuel Sewell, who had been a judge at the Salem trial. In 1706, the ultimate mean girl herself, Anne Putnam publicly repented. None of the other afflicted did. 
As for Judge Stoughton, he actually rose in government and became Chief Justice of the Colony. The town of Stoughton, Massachusetts is named for him, as is a dormitory at Harvard. Crime doesn't pay, but it can afford alumni contributions. He remained unrepentant, but we remember the Salem witch trials. Its shame remains a haunting metaphor of bigotry, hypocrisy, and hysteria. It is a warning to us. Perhaps we don't always heed it. After all, Arthur Miller, writing, living through the 1950s, was inspired to write an allegory, The Crucible, about his own time, but setting it in Salem. There have been times in America when, through politics and fear, we have again succumbed to blind persecution. Joseph McCarthy. Now remember it as a noun, McCarthyism. Witch hunt. An intensive effort to discover and expose disloyalty, subversion, or the like, usually based on slight, doubtful, or irrelevant evidence. And that frenzy is still called a witch hunt. Now, if you're wondering, when children come trick-or-treating, I do not pass out copies of The Crucible. And, you know, but you can see where I recently saw a production of The Crucible. And let us say it seems more timely than ever. I mean, history does have a way of repeating and resonating th through time to us. It's not only our inheritance, it's an ongoing legacy. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or lavish praise, I welcome them. You can contact me at my email address. Eugene at FinnermanWorks.com. Come back next week, and we'll find another treasure in the history junk shop. Till then.